Hello, this video is all about exponential decay and half-life within radioactivity. Here's a little reminder about activity. Uh, the activity of a sample, which is how many nuclei are actually decaying per second, depends on the number of undecayed nuclei that you have at any point in time. So you have a certain number of nuclei and when you multiply that by the decay constant, i.e. the probability that one of the any one of the nuclei will decay per unit time, you get a value for the activity. So some of this number are going to decay. But that means that the number remaining is going to be less because some of them have decayed in, as part of the activity. So as, the acti as time goes on, the activity reduces because the number remaining reduces. And the fact that you've got less re reduces the, the activity, which again reduces the number of remaining. So the, the, the activities and, and the number of nuclei are both going to decrease over time. So you can think of the activity as the rate of change of the number of undecayed nuclei. What we're going to look at here is the pattern that this follows. Okay, so we're going to start off by looking at half-life. Uh, the half-life of a radioactive sample is defined as the time taken for the activity of that sample to fall by half. Um, and you can substitute the, the word activity by the number of undecayed nuclei or indeed by the count rate, which is the, the number that you're actually uh, detecting in your Geiger-Muller tube per second. So it can either be activity or number of nuclei or count rate, but it's the time taken for that quantity in the radioactive sample to fall by a half. So here is the half bit of half-life, and here is the time. Half-life is actually, actually measured in uh, seconds. So this is the life bit, the time is the life bit, and this is the half bit. Okay, so here's a half-life curve down here, which you may remember from uh, GCSE studies. Um, we've got the counts per minute up here on the y-axis, and the time in days on the x-axis. So in this case we're looking at the actual count rate of the sample rather than the activity or the number of nuclei. So the way to find the half-life is to take any number on the y-axis, here we're going to take the initial number 80, and what you do then is you halve it. You divide that number by 2, uh, so that's the half bit, and then you go along to the line and down, and you work out what the time difference is between what you had at the beginning of that, of that uh, exercise and what you had at the end. And in this case, it's two days. And that time is the half-life of your radioactive sample. Uh, and half-life is usually denoted as T half. One of the things about this nuclear decay is that it doesn't matter where you start. So if you wanted to start here at 40, you could halve that again okay and go down to 20 so divide by 2 again and then you would go along to the line and down and you try and figure out what the time interval was between 40 and 20 and you can see again that it's the same so that's another half-life and that's a key point about radioactive decay the time is the same wherever you start as long as you divide that number by 2 so you can see if we do it a third time we go from 20 to 10 so we're dividing by 2 again, you come along to the line from 10 all the way along here and down to the axis and you can see that again you have two days. So you've got a third half-life in there. So after six days you have reached three half-lives of this particular radioactive isotope, whatever it is. Okay, so we've gone from 80 to 40, that's one half-life. Halved again from 40 to 20, that's another half-life and halved again from 20 to 10, and that's the third half-life. So in six days, we will actually have an eighth of our initial um, count rate, because we've divided by two three times. And that's how half-life curves work. Okay, let's try and link the half-life into the decay constant, because there's a very close relationship between the two. And for any radioisotope at all, obviously they're going to have different decay constants, because the probability that any nucleus within that sample will decay per second is different for different radioactive nuclei. Uh, and also the half-life is different for each type of radioactive isotope. 
but when you take the product of those, when you multiply the half-life by the decay constant, you always get the same value, all right, which is 0.693, or in other words, it's the natural log of two. And we'll look, about, we'll look at why that is in a minute. Okay, so very close correlation. So these two are inversely proportional. Ones with uh, small decay constants have large half-lives, and ones with high decay constants, large decay constants, have, have short half-lives. And that kind of makes sense, really, because if you've got something with a large probability that each atom is going to decay per second, then that's going, they're going to decay quite quickly, and therefore you're going to have a short half-life. Okay. So the pattern that's been underlying this whole discussion is exponential decay. Um, now, this isn't the, the, the time to go into the details of exponential decay as a mathematical function, uh, we're just going to apply it to radioactive systems. Um, but, you know, there are many natural systems where uh, exponential decay occurs. For example, capacitors, uh, damping of oscillating systems, all sorts of things. And it's based around the number E. Now, because we're talking about exponential decay, things that decrease with time, the, the power of E must be negative. So we're talking about E to the minus power. Now, in this case, we're talking about e to the minus lambda t. So there, there's our link between um, decay constant and time again. Okay, so this is our exponential power that we're going to use in radioactivity. The decay constant and the time, negative, or, or which is all um, together the power of e that we're going to use. So let's put that into context. This is um, an exponential decay equation for radioactivity. Here we've got A, which is the activity at time t. And here we've got A0. Now A0 is the activity initially. So effectively at time 0, t equals 0. All right, so that's the initial activity, A0. And here is our exponential factor. So E here is the exponential function. Lambda is the decay constant. And t is the time. Notice it's not the half-life, it's a general t. Okay, so this is at any time t. So that's, that's why this is uh, the activity at time t, because this t is any time t, if that makes sense. All right, now, um, because of the nature of radioactive decay, you can also substitute n, which is the no number of undecayed um, nuclei, or r, which is the count rate in here instead of activity. So this thing works for n equals n naught e to the minus lambda t, or r for count rate equals r naught e to the minus lambda t as well. So it works for all three measurable um, decaying functions that you can uh, that you can use. Okay, so here we've got a, a, a question that um, asks us to use this equation. So let's have a, a look at this. Um, a certain radioactive sample has an activity of 359 becquerel. So this is A naught. Okay, so we, this is the activity at the beginning, at the, the initial activity. Uh, becquerels is the same as seconds to the minus 1, so that's our unit there. If the decay constant for this isotope is 2.9 times 10 to the minus 4 per second, what will the activity be after 100 minutes? Okay, so first of all, let's get our units uh, all consistent. So we've got per second, per second, and minutes here. So this one needs to be changed into uh, seconds. So there's 60 seconds in a minute. So that's going to be 6,000 seconds. All right, so let's put our equation down. A is equal to A naught e to the minus lambda t. So substituting our values, no rearrangement required. A naught is 359. So 359 becquerels or counts per second sorry, decays per second, uh, multiplied by e to the minus 2.9 times 10 to the minus 4 times by t, which is 6,000 seconds. And when you punch all that into your calculator, you get 63 becquerels. So after 100 minutes, the activity will have decayed from 359 becquerels to 63 becquerels. So in that particular instance, that's re as long as you're happy with the exponential function, that's a reasonably straightforward calculation. Um, so going into a bit more detail about the reasons why 
um, when you halve the the the, um, the activity, the time stays the same no matter, no matter what the starting point. Let's have a look at this. Now, this is uh, one of the properties of exponentials uh, and exponential decay generally. It's what we call a constant ratio function. Um, okay, so that means in, in a given time interval, for example, the half-life, but in any any time interval, delta t, um, the value of uh, the activity or the number of remaining nuclei will change by a constant ratio. And that's where the half bit comes in effectively. So the way that works is um, here we've got a ratio n1 over n2, right? So that's the number of remaining nuclei at time t equals t1 and the number of remaining nuclei at time t equals t2. That is effectively equal to the ratio of e to the minus lambda t1 divided by e to the minus lambda t2. What we've done here effectively is gone, okay, let's take two examples of, of the basic equation. N1 is equal to N0 times e to the minus lambda t1 and divide that by uh, a second um, instance. So at time t equals t2, N2 is equal to uh, N0 uh, e to the minus lambda t2. And obviously you can't have two equal signs there, so we effectively change those for just one, um, like that. Now, because the initial activity is the same, because we're, we're looking at the same system, these cancel out. All right, so this bit here comes from taking the ratio of, of the number remaining at two different times, t1 and t2. n naught cancels out to give you this. Now, due to the laws of indices, uh, we can we can take these two uh, things that are divided by other by each other and turn them into one expression by realizing that a power divided by another power is equal to the difference in the two powers. So because lambda is the same, because it's a constant, that comes outside the brackets effectively factorized, and we end up with, instead of e to the minus lambda t1 over e to the minus lambda t2, we end up with e to the minus lambda brackets t1 minus t2. So that coming from there to there is just using the rules of indices. So what we're saying is the ratio of n1 over n2 is equal to e to the minus lambda times t1 minus t2. Uh, and because for a fixed time interval delta t, that that is constant, for example, a half-life, um, this ratio n1 over n2 is also a constant. Uh, and that's what the constant ratio thing means. For a fixed time interval, t1 minus t2, let's say for 10 seconds, um, the ratio of the, uh, the numbers remaining after, the, after those times is also a constant. So every 10 seconds or every half-life or however, however you want to measure the time, the number remaining goes down, not by the same amount, but by the same ratio. Okay, so you might get questions on that. So I'm trying to show maybe from a half-life curve, show that this is uh, a constant ratio property and, and you just do that you just take two time intervals which are the same and you show that the ratio of n1 over n2 is also the same okay so let's have a look at how we arrive at that expression we had earlier so you may remember that we had um, lambda times t half is equal to 0 0.693 uh, which is also equal to the natural log of 2 one of the things that you're required to do is um, derive this right, and show this to be the case. So we're going to rush through that now. Um, so the, the, the first things uh, to realize are that at the half-life, the time is equal to t half. And so again, at the half-life, the activity at that particular point is going to be a naught, which is initial activity, times e to the minus lambda t half. All right, so that's the half-life there. But also at the half-life, if we take the ratio of a to a naught, that's the activity at the half-life compared to the initial activity, by definition that must be equal to a half because you, you must have half of what you had initially uh, you know, by the time you reach the half-life. So we can rearrange this expression taking that into account. We can say a over a naught is equal to e to the minus lambda t half, so we're working at the half-life uh, and this is equal to a half, so that we can say that half is equal to e to the minus lambda t half. Now you may see where we're going now, because what we want to end up with is, is log 2. So 
Um, again, this is not the, the, the forum for a discussion on the nature of the exponential function. But suffice it to say that the, the exponential function and the natural logarithm are inverse functions. So if we take the natural logarithm of both sides here, this factor, the, the exponential function will disappear uh, because of the, in, the, the inverse function of those two. So we can say that the natural log of a half is equal to the natural log of that whole thing, e to the minus lambda t half. And these two cancel each other out. I'm going to go up here now, meaning that natural log of a half is equal to, this comes down and stops being a power and, and ends up on the main line, is equal to minus lambda t half. Okay, right now to get rid of this minus sign, uh, we divide, but we multiply both sides by minus one. And again, with the rules of indices, that gives you the natural log of two because natural log of a, minus the natural log of a half is equal to the natural log of two. So the natural log of two is equal to lambda t half, which is what we were required to demonstrate. Okay, so the way we've done that is by realizing that a over a naught is equal to a half, rearranging the formula for the exponential decay, taking logs of both sides and simplifying, and that's led us to this, which is a very important um, equation in radioactivity. Okay, so here's an example. This one requires us to rearrange in a similar way that we did before. So. Um, the question is, how long will it take for the activity of an isotope with the decay constant of that, lambda equals 4.22 times 10 to the minus 5 per second, to fall to 1% of its initial value? So they're not actually giving us any um, actual figures for the activity, but we do know that um, it's going to fall to 1% of its initial value in a certain time, and we need to calculate that time. How long? So let's start again. We've got A equals A naught e to the minus lambda t. So we want to find a value for a over a naught again, so it falls to 1% of its initial value. So 1% of a, of a value is equal to 0 0.01 or a hundredth times that value. So a over a naught is equal to 0 0.01, which means that we can put that into the equation as a over a naught, so rearranging, bringing this one down under here, so 0 0.01 is equal to e to the minus lambda t. So again, we're going to take natural logs of both sides. So natural log of 0 0.01 is equal to the natural log of e to the minus lambda t. The natural log and the e cancel, giving you minus lambda t. Again, I'm going to go up to the second half of the screen. So to get rid of that negative sign, we do uh, we take the inverse of this, which leads us with the natural log of 100 is equal to lambda t, because 1 over 0 0.01 is 100. Divide by lambda, so we've got natural log of 100 divided by lambda, and we can put the value for lambda in at this point, 4.22 times 10 to the minus 5 is equal to the time that we're interested in, uh, and therefore that time is equal to 1.09 times 10 to the 5 seconds. Okay, so about 100,000 seconds. Uh, so we're using that technique now to work out whatever we need to in this little bit up here, the actual exponential power. All right.